School Board meeting of Tuesday, May 14th is called to order. The first item on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening. Um, the first item on the agenda is adjustments to the agenda. And I have one. We just have a little something for um, Carla Bernstein, who this is her last um, official meeting. And if you want to come up to the podium, we have a little something for you. <laughs> We have something for Carla, and we want to thank Carla for her two and a half years of service. We really appreciate it. We have enjoyed working with you, and we wish you well with all your free time to come. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Carla. Thanks. Um, I was going to say a few things in communications, but I might as well say it now <laughs> since I received my little um, gift. Thank you very much. Um, I have kind of mixed feelings tonight. I am relieved at regaining a chunk of my life and my family is relieved at regaining a chunk of my life but I've um, truly enjoyed the pretty much day-to-day -day, um, stimulation and the day-to-day -day contact with the school community and I will miss that. Um, I was quite fortunate when I came on that the um, building referendum had just passed so all of that hard work was already done and it was just when we were refocusing on curriculum and policy and that was fun to be involved in that. And I have um, mentioned to some people that in a few years, my intent right now, at this instant, is in a few years when my children are older to perhaps run again. So maybe in a few years someone can call me and remind me that I said that. And um, I'd like to thank Connie Goldman and Connie Brown and Mary Bruns and um, the school community and the town community and everyone on the board. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. supposed to open it now? Oh, I don't know. Whatever you want. <laughs> are, there, are there any other adjustments to the agenda? Connie. I'm just going to move the reading committee out of the school board subcommittee under my report. You're going to move the reading committee? It's under school board subcommittees okay. and reports. I'm just going to move it up under superintendents. Okay. Any other adjustments? Seeing none, the next item on the agenda is approval of April 9th school board minutes. <clears throat> Charlie? On page 28C, um, 8A, proposed physical year 96-97 budget. And it's a third paragraph down. And it, it's a reference to Kurt McCandless' presentation. I think the 2.5 FTEs is incorrect. It was not a proposed increase. Of, it was a proposed increase of 0.2 FTEs. Sorry. Not 2.5. Thank you. Okay. Any others? Nope. Um, school board minutes as amended are approved then? We vote? We don't vote. And no further no further actions or amendments. They stand approved. They stand approved. Um, next item on the agenda is comments by high school and middle school reps. Did I see middle school reps or high school? I just see middle school first? Right. Hi. Um, my name is Allison Cunningham, and I'm just filling in for our regular school board reps because neither of them could make it tonight. And um, in the fifth and sixth grade, um, the sixth graders are going to Chiwanki next week, and um, they just had their, the fifth and sixth grade just had their band concert last week, and some of the sixth grade, um, along with the seventh and eighth grade, are going to be marching in the Memorial Day Parade, and um, the seventh and eighth grade band um, went to Peaks Island yesterday, and we had a successful trip, and in, at Peaks Island we played for the elementary school. Um, and the seventh grade, seventh and eighth grade band concert is Thursday night, and you're all invited to come to that. 
and the eighth grade in their science classes are doing solar cars and and we make our own solar cars and we just um, race them against um, other classmates and um, the 28 students who took place in um, took part in the national French exam all place um, statewide and a few of them even place nationally and the highest score for our school came in second in the nation and spring sports also started about two or three weeks ago including lacrosse baseball softball track and tennis and last week we had spirit week and um, each of the days of the week um, it had a certain theme like pajama day or clash day and the students are supposed to dress up accordingly to show school spirit that's basically it thanks and then any questions thank you are there some high school reps hi um, our SATs were last uh, on May 4th and another day is June 1st, and most of the juniors and some of the seniors have taken them or are planning to take them. Our elections for the SAC were held last week. I forgot. That's my fault to not have the list. I forgot to see Mr. Perry to get it, but I'll try and remember in the next meeting. Um, the senior class held a dance for the middle school last Friday. Um, graduation is June 7th, and following that night, they'll go to project graduation from 8.15 till 5 the next morning. Um, our musical is underway, and that is set for May 22nd and 23rd. Um, and our music concert is set for May 30th. And along with our elections, um, we were supposed to introduce next year's uh, school board reps, but they're not here. But they're going to be Matt Lunt and Ryan Kane. Thank you. Are there any other questions, comments? Is this your last meeting? To we'll report be here to in us? June. Oh, you'll be here in June. Okay. Good. We'll make sure they're here so you can. Okay. <laughs> no, I was going. If you, this was your last one, I was going to thank you for your service. <laughs> one more. <laughs> one more. Great. Thank you. Next item is communications. Well, I put a number of things um, in the packet. I'll go over them quickly, and then we have it, um, one that will take longer. Uh, the seniors, I think, will be happy to know that they do, in fact, get a chance to graduate on <laughs> the 7th. That would be a little bit distressing if we weren't able to hold graduation. You may recall, because of snow days, we raised some issues, and uh, there were some plans to uh, help make up some of the days that were missed. Seniors, of course, don't have to have the full 180 or 175 anyway. Uh, but that was a problem in many, in many uh, districts throughout the state that a graduation date had been set. Snow days had eroded the uh, possibility of making that up. And although no waivers have been granted for anybody below a senior, the seniors for once do get a break. Uh, the waiver was requested for two days that we, we would have had to make up in some other way. And a number of school districts have requested those waivers, including this one. So I do have the official waiver. You can graduate on the 7th. Um, and you had copies of that in, uh, of the letter requesting that in your packet. Um, the, there's a communication in here from uh, uh, Michael McGovern concerning a proposal for concession stand track soccer field. You've had a chance to look at it. I think in the six years that I've been here, it's come up just about every year one way or the other. It's always a worthy project, but it always seems to snag on one process or another. I know when we were doing the kindergarten, move it came up and when we were doing the building project it came up and it does because uh, I'm told of previous difficulties with that project it does have to go through um, a town project so this is a uh, frankly a memo from the town manager saying if the board unless the board has strenuous objections they are willing to go forward with at least examining the process and if you have and I, I think we should be talking about this in conjunction with the athletic study committee the amount of funding and how much money it's going to bring in and just where where it fits in that's a good point we're meeting at the um, next week so. yeah sometime 21st. Tuesday the 21st at 2 30 we could bring it up then and okay I can, so essentially you want this referred to the athletic study committee Oops. and good. you'd like me to make sure that Michael knows that 
right? It's fun. Uh, I don't see why it has to go to the to the athletic study committee if it's a building project. No, but in ter in terms of who's who's funding it and you know use of booster money to do it and and that kind of thing, we were going to talk about what what that kind of money would be used for and just the relationship between the boosters and, and the school. I mean, I, I remember this proposal. We've seen it again and again. But we don't have um, you know, a whole lot of information about that. It just seems like it would be worth putting it through that committee. The meeting's next week. And if it doesn't seem appropriate to deal okay, with it, Okay, then I'll get back. On. I'll put, I'll put right. some kind of follow-up report on the June agenda, and I will talk to Michael in the meantime about them. Sounds fun. Any other comments? Okay. We have we have a letter here from uh, Mr. Hutchings, the co-chair of the Youth Exchange Committee for the Archangel Committee. Uh, frankly, thanking uh, the school department and the board for our support, along with other school districts, for the recent visit. Uh, and if anybody's looking for that delightful bird, it's actually in our office. Um, suspended it's really a beautiful piece of work now that I've had a chance mm. to look at it my understanding is it's carved out of one piece of wood mm. which is quite a trick I don't know how they do it it's beautiful I put a um, letter in your packet from a parent uh, I thought it was a particularly thoughtful letter in the sense that uh, she includes not only the details of the various uh, incidents in it's a fairly long letter, so I'm not going to read it. Uh, but just for the any public watching, this is a parent whose child at Pond Cove was involved with a one of those things that happens to kids. Um, lost a uh, a stuffed toy that had been brought in for an exhibit. Um, she was impressed with the way the children worked together with the staff. Found it. Uh, she makes some very interesting comments that um, the spirit among the children supportive of each other across a range of uh, personality types and needs and so forth. And so I thought it was a, um, a nice letter to include in your packet. And we thank Louise Thomas for sending it to us. You have a principal's report um, from Tom Eismeyer. And I'm assuming that um, if you have questions, he is here, obviously, to answer them. Uh, this is essentially giving you a follow-up uh, to an issue that was brought up as part of your yearly goal-setting process. You really wanted a thoughtful examination of the possibility of trimester reporting from Pond Cove since we'd gone to that in the middle school. And uh, the board felt that there might be something to be gained by having them on two on, on the similar schedule. Um, what I would point out is, as you can see, having had this in your packet and having a chance to read it, there's been a thoughtful process. Um, their uh, report back is that at this time they do not think it would be uh, a feasible shift, transition, to leave it as it is. But as uh, Tom points out to all of us, that the, um, the report has opened up a lot of discussion about exactly how the report cards themselves, the conferencing, and some of those interim reports should be looked at. And so there'll be further work on it, as I understand it. Charlie. There were two schools that you looked at. Were there any other schools out there that are doing trimesters besides Portland and South Portland? And what has been their experience? I mean, we didn't see any of that in the report of what experience one, they're having. With you know, one of the interesting findings was um, when they contacted K through 12 systems that there was no uniformity from elementary to middle school to high school in any of the districts. So I'm not sure how many were contacted, but the, uh, the pros and cons came directly through interviews, telephone calls from the people who were actually doing it in elementary school. And that information was presented to teachers who looked, again, at pros and cons from people who hadn't done it yet. Um, in other words, shifting from four to three. But. Um, the curious thing was there's, there was no trimester all the way up through in any of the districts around here. Are there any other districts that the middle school besides that? I, I think so. I, I th it seemed to be a middle school, a high school seemed more locked into uh, quarters. And so um, were most elementary schools. I know South Portland, this was their first year, I believe. Yes. 
And I guess the jury is out on that still. But uh, and I think that Pond Cove decided that uh, without a really firm grip on the reporting system itself, it wouldn't be, uh, the, the key thing is, is not trimesters, it's the content of what we're doing. And uh, although some people thought that was in the future they might not look at it, I think the consensus was not a good idea now. After we straighten things out, it might be reexamined. Thank you. Tom, I just wanted to ask you, I mean, in reality at Pond Cove, we're on a semester system. Is, is that not true? We get report cards. Quarter, yeah. No, right, we, right, we right, don't get right. them quarterly. I'm confusing report cards and progress reports. You're right. But we don't even get a progress report in the fall. You go in for a conference, and right. some teachers do give you a written report, and other ones don't. But I think we should be clear that even though we've said quarters all along for Pond Cove, in reality, we're on a semester system. Semesters, and uh, I think there was a fairly recent shift from required conferences twice a year to spring being optional. Yes, right. that is true. But there, there was no, when you talk about quarters or a marking period, we really were on a semester system. So I think going to the trimester seemed like a lot more work for the teachers because it would be asking them to report out actually more than they do now. Yes, it would have been, I think, in the teacher view, six times. Exactly, which is what the middle school four. does. Right. You get the three right. report right. cards, and then in between each one, you get a progress report. Right. Where at Pond Cove, you get two report cards, and in the fall, your progress report would be the conference, and in the spring, your progress report would be a written sheet with an optional conference. Right. And I just wonder, how much did you talk to parents about their feelings on the um, on trimesters versus what, we, what in actuality we have as a semester? I don't know if we did it this year. I think the latest work that was done with that was, was conferences themselves, so I'm not sure how much weight that had in this discussion. I sympathize with the teachers, and I do think we need to look at our assessment tools. But I also look at, from the parents' point of view, that we may need more contact. There was a lot of talk about that. And uh, on the other side of the coin, some teachers felt that trimester would mean less contact because of the timing. So there, there was considerable discussion about that. Mm. Um, everybody wants more contact. It's just uh, getting it organized and deciding how we're going to do it. I would disagree with it being, but that's right. why I wanted to state that it yeah. was—it really was a semester we were on, and we were asking them to increase it. But right, I think it's a distinction between progress reports and report cards that I haven't fully mastered yet. Either. <laughs> Sorry. I sometimes use them interchangeably and get in trouble for that. Yeah, Anne. Two things. Um, it, would it be possible for us to get copies of the results of the surveys? We have the surveys themselves, but not the I think information so. sure. that came out. Yeah. That would be great. Um, and also, I would just comment that um, I don't have kids in Pond Cove anymore, but those uh, report cards are incredibly labor intensive. And um, I wonder if part of the assessment evaluation, whether uh, Pond Cove is going to look at moving to something that could be put on the computer. Yeah. Um, yes. I, I think that if you accept the recommendation, I think there will be less time spent on trimester and quarters or semesters and more time on the actual assessment, the report cards, progress reports, and the content of the conferences. Well, I think those need to be done, but I, I, yeah. I hope this trimester idea is not going to die because I think there would be some advantages to getting everybody in sync. And frankly, having had kids in Pond Cove and now having kids in the middle school, I find the middle school reporting um, continuum very, very responsive to parent needs. You seem to hear um, in depth from the school at a very regular um, interval that that works works well and and I do think it would be valuable to maybe survey parents about um, what they the, would think well, at the, both levels. The other thing that came out of this too was just general communication with parents. Mm -hmm. We learned that at the uh, parents meeting. We've uh, heard it before that some teachers, in fact, a great number of them, send home regular correspondence about what's coming up in the curriculum, but not all. Right. And it comes out at varying times. So I, I think that'll be part of it, too. Thanks. Split Thanks. decision on that one, huh? OK. <laughs> Charlie. I would still want to keep it an open yeah. topic. Yeah. Because I, I, I think what it yeah. does, it standardizes more frequent communication with parents on a more formal basis. 
And again, you, you alluded there, there are teachers who are staff who are out there doing it, you know, on their own more often, but that's not consistent. And this is a way of making it more consistent. Yeah. I, I think you know, whether you approve or disapprove, I, I think we, we have to settle the issue and then get on to the actual content because the, the, the trimester was certainly not appealing to the Pond Cove teachers. But. Thank you. Are there any other comments, questions? Connie? I would like to point out that one of the things that Tom has done this year is to involve all the faculty in small group discussion of uh, building wide issues. This is a uh, been a, it's been a sort of multi-layered, multifaceted effort this year, uh, which I think can be very productive. This is um, an example of a process that I know the teachers took seriously, that Tom certainly gave them an opportunity to um, do some data collection and some review of an issue. Uh, and so, frankly, I would appreciate the effort that went into it and applaud you, Tom, as the principal for getting that process started. And I do think that the real issue is, well, how do we assess and how do we communicate? Not necessarily um, some of the other issues, but this is at least a start. OK, and I'll get you the results. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Tom. Going on? Yeah. OK, now we come to the piastre de resistance. Um, I don't suppose there's anybody that lives in Cape Elizabeth that doesn't know that we had a problem with our prom. But I also hope that everybody in Cape Elizabeth is equally aware that we are proud of our principal, who has principals. Because one of the things that happens when um, something unpleasant, untoward, um, disturbing happens, uh, a lot of times it is how you deal with it and how you try to sort it out that is at least as important as what actually happened. Um, many of us have spent a lot of time in the past week trying to figure out what happened, wh what it is really telling us about what has to happen in the future, and particularly the administration has had to sort out in all kinds of aspects, policies, punishments, consequences, and uh, I think also a lot of uh, conversations because um, the students themselves are at the center of this problem. Um, it's not going to help to have adults necessarily, uh, well, it may help, but it isn't going to cure the problem to have adults just once again swirling around and uh, wringing our hands about it. I think we've got to involve students. And I have personally been at meetings uh, with uh, not only Rick DeFusco, but also Dwight Ely, one of the advisors. Um, there's a lot of concern about what happened. I think you've all seen the letter. You've read the newspaper articles, I'm sure. Um, some of you have been present at some meetings and had some conversations. Um, I think Rick has a few statements to make, and I know that all of you have some comments to make, but I certainly wanted to start by thanking uh, Rick, the high school uh, faculty and administration, all those who were at the prom, um, including our board member, Charlie Greer. Uh, and I think you've done the best that you can under the circumstances, but we all know this feels like a day late and a dollar short. You've summed it all up. Thank you. <laughs> well, a couple of things. This past week, as uh, Connie alluded to, there have been a number of discussions and meetings, not only with students, but also the faculty. Uh, had, we, we had a faculty meeting yesterday, and from that generated a small committee. Uh, the consequences for 11 students were uh, meet it out. One thing I would like to clear up, uh, and the paper referred to eight students who were caught. Uh, we had to forfeit the game because eight students were caught. Those students came forward when they were confronted by the coach and admitted to drinking alcohol at the prom. And I would like to compliment those kids, not for, for their actions, but, but, but for their honesty and dealing with it up front with their coach. And I wish we had more athletes and students in Cape High School like those softball players who would, who would own up to their poor decision making. Um, I look forward to, to working with parents and students uh, to have a dialogue about how we will go from this point on with all school, major school sponsored uh, events in the future. Um, also, I look to tie in now with the Co Cape Coalition uh, changing its direction with, with uh, uh, new leadership 
that we also have more involvement there as a school with parents and also have a, I would love to have a student board that, that participates with the coalition on a, on a regular basis, that they are a sounding board to the, uh, to, to the coalition uh, and similar to a class officer, have a group of students who do that on a regular basis. I do, would like to read to you, uh, the faculty did uh, come up with uh, uh, six points that they, they wanted to make clear to the community and, and to the school board. And I'd like to read those to you. It says, as a school staff, we believe school-sponsored activities should be substance-free. We believe that adults, parents, and teachers are models of behavior, decorum, and expectations. We believe that clear limits, expectations, and boundaries assist emerging adults in decision-making. We believe that consequences should be appropriate, consistent, clear, and respectful. We believe that the establishment of behavioral parameters is the domain of faculty, staff, administration, parents, the community, and our students. And lastly, we believe that support should be collegial, administrative, and community-based collaborative. And from these, from these issue, uh, six points, the faculty would like to come up with a philosophy and a statement that will send the message clearly to the board, to the parents of the community, and to the kids on how strongly they feel about uh, these issues. And I was very pleased we had 38 faculty responded in a, within a three-hour window of time today to, to get, get this information back to, to me. And Katie Lisa and Elaine Brownell were the two faculty members who headed this this group and, and uh, generated this information. So I want to tell you that we as a, as a school um, want to be proactive as a faculty and as an administration to work with parents and kids. Um, and again, I see this, we have a window of an, a, a positive window of opportunity and we need to take advantage of that so that this, this sort of thing does not happen again. And uh, I, I appreciate your support and as we've gone through the last uh, week and a half um, and I, you know, look for your continued support and we'll Again, look forward to working through this. Questions? Well, I just wanted to add, Rick, that um, you and Connie and I met today with Dwight Ely and a number of his um, senior students, and they um, presented a proposal on how to make the senior trip a safe night. And we had some discussion, and I expressed the feeling of the board that there there was a, a large infraction at the prom, and it, it's hard for us um, to look the other way. And at that meeting, we did discuss um, that we might have a workshop on it and further discuss it, or that a senior student would come tonight and address it. When I talked to the board at the Finance Committee meeting, there was a feeling that we needed to come to some resolution on that issue tonight. And I feel badly that um, there isn't a senior student here to address it tonight, but the board feels strongly that um, the senior trip is maybe something that should not happen this year, and we can let board uh, members speak on that. We also wanted to address the fact that in the future, it's very important when an, um, something like this happens that we have a quick response team so that um, the administration is supported by the board and community, maybe representatives, and that decisions can be made quickly and that consequences are, are known ahead of time. And that... Um, that we need to make all those things clear for the future and work on that. But as for this particular issue, there is a feeling that it was a school-sponsored night that was um, a lot of misbehavior or um, blatant use of alcohol and drugs was shown and um, that there needs to be a response from this board on that. Charlie? I would just like to make a comment about the evening. I have to commend both Rick and his staff and his um, faculty um, chaperones for creating and maintaining a very safe environment for kids. Kids did not drink at the prom. Kids arrived at the prom under the influence. Once they were at the Marriott, they were in a safe environment and they actually enjoyed themselves. They're, I mean, I saw very few people not dancing. I have to, comm again, commend the staff for, for the amount of effort that they put in to take, to take care of students who were so, so bond that they had to, um, to be nurtured and nursed. But I want to make clear that the prom itself was a safe environment. The students arrived under the influence. I've been to seven proms and since I've been on the board, and I have to say, 
I saw probably the highest percentage of students arriving, arriving at the prom under the influence of something other than the excitement of the prom. Um, I also stayed later than I have at, at previous proms. I've usually gone as a board member to, to do the receiving line, but stayed because I was concerned. And, and when I did leave, I felt that the students were in very capable hands and were, would be safely taken care of. But the majority of students were having a good time and did dance and were in a safe environment. Um, in observing students as they arrived and noting the students that did come, come late or arrived before the cutoff of 9 o'clock, observing the number of students from the different classes. I mean, I would, I would also have to concur with, I think, the consensus of the board that uh, there were a number of seniors who did arrive late who seemed to be more under the influence of other than other students there, that I think there needs to be, be a message sent out to those students. It's the juniors and sophomores and freshmen who are going to have to deal with future proms if they're going to happen and how they're going to be handled. And they're going to have to take responsibility for that. The seniors don't have to take responsibility for anything that took place. And I think they're in denial. I really do. In conversations that I've had with seniors who are at that prom. And I feel that we, I'm a parent of a senior, and I think there is a message that has to go out that there are consequences for your actions. Some of those seniors did not step forward. Um, and, and I have to commend the seniors or students who did step forward and admit that they were under the influence before they arrived to the prom because it was a school-sponsored activity. But I feel that um, to reward the seniors with a class trip, which is, again, another sponsored activity that I think sends the wrong message, that there are consequences. And I think this is the consequences of their actions. Okay. Anne? Rick, I really um, thought the letter you wrote home to parents was a, was a very good, strong letter. Um, I guess the thing that depressed me about it was that you've written these letters before to parents about these very same issues, and they seem to come up again and again and again. Um, I think we've really got to uh, put the responsibility back onto the parents and onto the students to take, to take some ownership of, of this problem and decide whether they even think it's a problem. Maybe people don't think it's a problem. But it has become the school's problem for all the reasons you stated. We have to sort it out. It's breaking school rules. <clears throat> You're responsible for those kids while they're there, and God forbid anything happens uh, to them on the way home. And I agree with uh, Charlie. I think that the, uh, the senior trip should not be a school-sponsored trip. I see absolutely no reason to put you or your staff um, through this so soon after after this event. Um, if, if the seniors want to have a trip, I think they and their parents should work something out um, to make that happen. Let, let them take responsibility for, for that. It amazes me um, that we have all the, all the money and effort that goes into project graduation to make one little chem-free space. Um, and then we have this going on all the time. And it's not just these events, it's all the time. And it's not the school's problem, and I think we need to put it back onto, um, onto the community to fix it. Um, the things that we can do something about, we're going to uh, try to address at the next policy right. subcommittee meeting. And I gave you that memo, and it's going to be held next Thursday, May 23rd. We will be discussing um, co the contracts for athletes, that, that whole issue of you know, consequences for um, you know, for bad behavior as far as participating in athletics. And we're also going to be reviewing the drug and alcohol policy for students because apparently there is a kind of a loophole as, as far as consequences for arriving at an event under the influence as opposed to consuming at the event. So just so the community is on notice, we will be discussing those issues. 
Great. next week, but hopefully that's one way we can support you. And I really think it's important that we do put together some kind of committee, not just for the high school, but system-wide, when we have a difficult situation like this, so that we're all talking the same language, we all understand, um, and all you know, bounce ideas off each other about how how best to handle it quickly. So, but I I apologize as a member of the community that you've had to, had to be dealing with this for the past week. Well, it, it, getting back to, uh, to Charlie's uh, comment, this was my 11th prom, and, and uh, the level of consumption was real scary as far as the number of, I, I don't know how many more kids were drinking percentage-wise, but those that were seemed to be under the influence, uh, uh, under uh, more, more of a certain case than in past years. It, it seems that since we we can't you know exactly punish the the exact people because we don't really have a way of testing them we can't have blood tests in order to, to have gain entry to the prom uh, that unfortunately we have to group the we have to group them all together and and to give them a, a senior trip you know two weeks after something like this unfortunately I think we it, it, it sends out the wrong message that they need to have some sort of Result of what they've what they've and, and to do. just so you know, as, as Connie and, and, and Beth met with, with some students today, they were aware that that there were tremendous concerns, and they were just uh, trying to, to solve the problem or address the problem and and, and come up with a, a feasible response. So I was pleased that we we had that opportunity to talk about it, and and believe me, there, there's a large majority of the kids in the school who realize the issue, and now. What do we do about it? And I think that I, th I think that if uh, we can get the, the the students who did comply with the rules and not show up uh, after drinking and so forth, then maybe they might be able to put some more pressure on those that did. If if we make them all somehow all pay, I guess for this. <laughs> okay. Well, if I need to say something. <laughs> <laughs> I, I brought a copy of the um, athletic rules and regulation contract and it does say that during the season of practice, play or rehearsal, a student shall not use a beverage containing alcohol regardless of quantity. And some of the arguments that I've heard from some of our high school st uh, students has been, well, well, we didn't drink at the prom and that's what the contract says. Um, and that isn't what exactly what the contract says. But the um, thing that's most troublesome to myself, parent of, of a high school child and having had one just graduate, is the attitude that it's just so casual that um, it's what we always do or it's prom night. And I've met a couple of um, parents in the community this past week and can hardly go to the IGA without meeting somebody that wants to talk about it. Um, and the response is, I dread that night. I'm so glad it's over. At least they all got home safe. And I, I do think that we need to use this as a wake-up call. And this is not the only community that has this problem. And I, I, I'm embarrassed and I feel unfortunate that we are the ones that are in the paper every single day and that these eight or 11 students seem to be targeted in every article as, as the ones being punished when um, you and Charlie and everyone else that was there saying that this is, was a, a major problem and it was a different problem than we've had in the past. So I would like to see us collectively, students, faculty, community, think about the attitude and, and work towards um, impressing upon these young people that, that there are consequences for their actions and sure they're going on to college and maybe that's what college is like, but they're not in college now. and. It's, it just is out of hand. And bottom line, it's still illegal. And it's illegal. And I thought the editorial in the paper, Portland Press Herald, um, two days ago was right on the mark. And I was pleased that they supported you and applauded you. Thank you. And, and it's unfortunate that, that many children are going to have to be deprived of this evening that they've looked forward to. And because they were not involved in any of this. but. Um, it, it was a serious act and, and it, it needs to be addressed. And it shouldn't be held over next year's prom, the sophomores this year that were many not even involved in this year's prom, being punished for this year's prom. So we'll work that out. Are there any students that wanted to speak on this issue? Or anyone else? Community members? Yeah, come on up. Any 
getting up and talking after listening. Um, but I, I went to the prom this year. I'm a junior in high, the high school, and I went, also went to it last year. I just wanted to say that I don't really agree with the way the media took over, and I know that nobody went out and went for them and said, hey, put this in your article, but the last article I read made it seem like the Cape Elizabeth High School was the only prom that people showed up drunk and were mm -hmm. drinking, and that Falmouth High School and Bitterford High School and Scarborough High School had chem-free prom nights, and nothing went wrong. And I know that's as far from true as it could be. I'm, I personally went to another school my freshman year, and I know that that's not true. And I don't agree with the way they did that. And I also have, a t I'm not a senior this year, but as far as the senior trip goes, I think that, I mean, it's not okay that people drank when they went to the prom, and there's nothing I can say that can make excuses for them, but to punish the entire senior class and take a, you're suggesting taking away their senior trip, by thinking of doing that, you're punishing the entire senior class for some of their actions, and this is going to be one of their last times they're all together until their 20th reunion, and I just don't see that as fair. I mean, it doesn't directly involve me this year, but for being friends of some seniors that I know weren't drinking, if they get deprived of their senior trip, then you're depriving them of an experience that probably some of them have been looking forward to for a while just because of some others' mistakes. But we didn't say, we said we wouldn't sponsor it. We didn't say it couldn't be held. The parents can still sponsor it. And the students have raised the money. Mm -hmm. But we don't want to put the faculty and the administration in that role of chaperoning and supervising. I know. Um, I was talking to some people that were involved in that, and they were talking of like the students taking over, and, and weren't they talking about setting some guidelines or whatever limits? If you show up to it, they won't let you on like as the boat or whatever they're taking. Yeah. And if that, you get on the boat, they find out you've been drinking. You can't graduate with the class, but you can graduate. Yeah, that, that's exactly what was presented to um, Connie and Rick and I today. Was those kind of guidelines and. It still puts us in an awkward position that we're the ones trying to look in the eyes of a student and evaluate whether they have had a beer or no beers. Weren't or the students proposing to do it themselves? Or yes, yes, and they were proposing to speak with every senior before they went and explain that this is what was going to happen. It's still an awkward position, and we just feel as a school board that we, we can't be in that business anymore. It was, it was too difficult to, to do. Um, and it puts the administration and um, the chaperones in a very awkward position. Carla? The other point I might make is that we might not have to do a mass punishment, if you want to call it that, if more people who had been drinking would have admitted to it, besides the few on one team that did. And I think, you know, maybe some of the people who weren't drinking could go after those kids and say, look, we're all getting punished because you didn't have guts enough to say that you did it. And if the people who had done it had admitted to it, then maybe we would have left it at that and not felt like we had to do something else. A lot of people weren't confronted about the fact they drank, though, because I was nobody ever came up to me and said, Tina, did you drink at the prom? Tell me yes or no, and if you did, I'm going to punish you. Like, that never, like, happened to me, so you can't, like, I don't know if someone were to well, come to students, me. particularly students on the athletic teams, but in other extracurriculars, know what's supposed to happen. And everyone knows what happened to the softball team. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of kids chose not to admit it when a lot of people know and saw them and know who they are, but they're still not willing to come forward. And that does put us again in an awkward position. Priscilla. I, it is always awkward when you decide on something and some people who were not involved in it will suffer consequences. I think that it's interesting that the discussion that you were involved in was how to make the senior trip um, chem-free, drug-free, whatever, and not a discussion of the seniors' responsibility to their faculty, to the administration, to the community which has provided them with four years, in many cases 13 years, of um, pretty dedicated um, education. Those people let their community down. And we don't want to be party to supporting a party for them. It's as plain as that. Um, and I don't think that the juniors and the sophomores and the freshmen should be punished in future years. But I do think they need to go on notice of saying, if you want to have proms, if you want to have celebrations, 
you're part of it. You're responsible for making it go. You're you're practically on your way to being out into the world, whether you're going to college or to work or to whatever. And there are consequences to your actions. And I really am not seeing that there seems to be any accountability of that on the seniors' part. I'm listening to how faculty is trying to figure out how to deal with this should it happen again or to be ready. I would hope that we wouldn't have to be ready. I know that that's uh, naive or pie in the sky, uh, I would have been a lot more sympathetic if I had heard plans not how to make one event fly for the seniors, but how to offer a sincere apology to their community. Maybe it's being said and we're not hearing it, but I don't think it is. We did have more of a discussion than just how to make that um, the senior trip chem free or safe. I, I must say we didn't get really deep into it, but there was discussion on the mixed messages students received from the community. Um, and, and there was a little bit more than, than that, but there wasn't the apology type thing to your community. I did make copies of that. I, I would like to add one thing to Tina. I, I think your point was well made though that we seem to target the athletes and the athletes should step forward and many more students were involved than just athletes and, and I don't want them to be a group that we have focused on. It, we're looking at the whole population that attended the prom. Connie. One of the things that um, I certainly heard in the group was a, um, a serious discussion and a sense of the seriousness of not only this event but also a sort of an attitude and I'm going to pass out to you something that was on the high school wall sometime today uh, this is chapter one about what I assume is going to be a series of, of I think very interesting reflections on the situation from and a student um, and I certainly uh, applaud whoever wrote this in the sense of the ability to write it, it seems to me as almost a poetic overtone and I'm not absolutely certain what the total point of this is. I think it's, uh, there are some phrases in here that struck me. Um, do you think it's appropriate to read it? Yes, mm -hmm. go ahead. I thought it was this, is, um, this is a student statement, it's not signed. Um, and it says number one, so we're assuming there are going to be a series of comments. Um, and I think it is uh, very thought provoking. It says, so we are faced with a question. Do we confess before the authorities of Cape Elizabeth High School in the town of Cape Elizabeth? Do we nail ourselves to trees and cry out in despair? Yes, I drink, and I drank before the prom. Is that moral? To repent, to beg forgiveness and punishment from those who say they want, who say they want the truth, but who actually want us to lie? Those who buy us wine coolers, or close the door and turn the television up loud? Or help us stumbling into the Marriott? Or pretend not to hear when we shout out our after prom plans? Or accept that a par party is chem free even though the declaration is written in the shape of a mushroom? But then say, step forward, did you drink at the prom? I want to know, oh, I didn't think so, next. This is not a subtle contradiction. But on the other hand, by keeping quiet, we are not standing up for ourselves. We have established our wrongness and have edified the complete hopelessness of the situation. Whether or not we choose to tell, we are not being true to ourselves. We are not being moral. Either way, we become a part of the hypocrisy as it feeds on us and we begin to feed on it. And I wouldn't pretend to know necessarily, and I'm looking forward to future chapters, exactly what this student is saying. I think he or she is probing for some thoughts here. Uh, but I don't think this is blowing it up. I think it is at least examining it. Um, I suppose it could be read, this statement could be read with several interpretations, some of them more complimentary to the author than not. But I do think it's a thoughtful comment. Is there anybody else who would like to speak on this? Yeah. Okay. I just, can I just say one oh, yeah. more quick thing? It's not one of the big deals, but in the letter Mr. DeFusco sent home and in like the newspapers, they commented on how people have the limousines, they rent the limos or whatever, or they have student chauffeurs. 
And I don't think, like this isn't really a big deal, but it's something that bothered me a little bit. They made it out to seem like everybody got those so they could go and drink and not have to worry about driving, but I mean, I wouldn't want to have to drive if I was dressed up in my heels and my dress and everything. And I know a lot of people, like that's the reason. Like they say it's been a tradition and, and mostly implying that it is for the ability to drink and not have to worry about driving. But I don't think it's necessarily because of that. I think it's more because of the excitement of I had never been in a limo before this prom. And I was like, wow, you know, not just because, oh, I can get drunk now and not have to drive. Okay. It's just another thing. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Can you just state your name? When you come up? First, please excuse my appearance. Um, I don't normally come with dirt on my knees. However, I just came back from gardening and discovered what you people were discussing. My name is Joyce Freeman. I live at Three Childs Road. I have a daughter, Jessica, who's a senior. Um, I f just feel like I need to tell you um, about some good kids. Um, my daughter went to the prom and had a wonderful time and was not one of the ones that, um, who did drink at the prom. I guess I'm very tired of um, Cape Elizabeth and the drinking problem out here for whatever reasons. I'm not going to point fingers at parents or the school system at all. But I am very tired of the good kids being not read about in the paper. I am tired of the fact that even tonight you're considering not having a senior trip for children like Bethany, Boardman and Jessica and a number of others who have given their time to the school system, represent the school system very well, and have gone on to going to college next year, and I don't think they should suffer the consequences. I feel confident in saying that there are a number of senior parents that would give up their evening and be there if we need to do breath anal analyzers, whatever we need to do, get parents to sign. I know that they've been working very diligently on having a process for the kids to go through that night, have parents sign, call them if their kids show up at the boat under the influence. Call them, take them home. That should have been done the night of the prom. Wasn't done the night of the prom. Take them home. The parents need to have some say in this, and they need to for once in their life have to come and suffer the consequences too. I am embarrassed. I felt I had to go to work the next day and explain, not my daughter, not my daughter, even though I knew people didn't think that, I still felt that way. I know there are other drinking problems in other school systems, it, but we're getting the bad publicity. But please consider the good kids. Why should they not have a senior trip to kind of reprimand certain ones, and I know again it's difficult to know who did and who didn't because they aren't all owning up to it. Some sports teams have been very forward about this and are suffering the consequences, and you've got other sports teams that are not coming forward and saying that they did it, so they're getting off. I know all of that. You can't handle You can't really know who did and who didn't, but I do think that there is enough time left to salvage the senior trip, do it right, do what you have to, and then think about next year with the prom, needs to get away from the school system. School systems have done enough, um, whether you read about South Portland and having pets in the classrooms or you read about here, schools not having proms, enough is enough. Schools can't do everything and it's going to have to be decided by the parents of the community if they're going to do things. So I hope you will remember the other kids too, um, the ones that are going to su suffer the consequences of those that did the wrong things the night of the prom and remember them when you make a decision tonight. Thanks. Anybody else like to speak? Uh, either. Come. <laughs> My name is Beth Boardman. I'm a senior this year and I went to the prom and I wasn't drinking and I'm also pretty sure that it wasn't only seniors that had been drinking and abusing the privilege. And I mean, purely on that basis, I think it's wrong to cancel the senior trip this year and to punish all the seniors and to let the juniors get off scot-free or the sophomores who might have been drinking or freshmen who might have been attending and drinking. And I think just because there's no way to know that there was one core group of people drinking in, this, in the senior class, that it's unfair to the people that weren't drinking to only punish the seniors or to punish the entire senior class. And it's also unfair to the people and the underclasses that were drinking to only punish the senior class because it seems to me that if you want to punish people, then the people who committed the crime should be punished and not just this group, okay, we're going to pick the seniors and they're going to be our example. And I just think that's wrong. Thanks. Would you like to speak? Yeah. 
Alec Boardman. It's rare that someone gets to follow their daughter up to uh, <laughs> say a few words. <laughs> Uh, I, I think I, I go back to my days in high school. I can remember uh, the, the big news of, of the uh, mid-60s was Darien, Connecticut, where there was this big alcohol abuse situation, uh, probably on a much bigger scale, but what we're seeing, the kind of thing we're seeing in this town. And I think before you lay all the blame at the feet of the kids, you have to lay the blame at the feet of the parents who, and I don't know who, I'm not pointing fingers specifically, but we all know there are parents in this town who enable the alcohol consumption either through turning the other turning the other way and looking the other way or actually providing an environment in which the alcohol can be assume, consumed uh, so again I would I would echo the remarks of those who come before me tonight and say don't place all the blame all the blame at the feet of the kids and don't punish the kids who were not a part of this problem uh, because of other people who did create the problem thanks would anybody else like to speak Um, I just wanted to respond a little bit to what we heard, and it is the biggest dilemma for us as school board members when you come with a blanket or are considering a blanket punishment that you do punish the innocent along with the guilty, and that is the hardest hardest thing to wrestle with. Um, and I think addressing that the seniors versus the juniors and the sophomores, which we obviously know were drinking also, um, it was not just the seniors, was sort of what Charlie was saying, that we're going to address those issues in the time to come by looking at the prom for next year and looking at the policies we have and those kind of things. It seems to us as a board, and other board members can speak, that it is inappropriate for us to be sponsoring a trip for seniors in the next three weeks when there was such a blatant display of abuse at this um, function. And if those parents would like to step forward and take over that trip and offer it, it becomes the parents' trip, and then it is not the school that is offering it. Um, it the senior trip is the first of three nights of celebration for those seniors. They have the senior trip, which is six to nine at night on a boat. The next night, they would have their awards and banquet night, and the following night is project, uh, project graduation after the graduation. So it is not that the students will not have opportunities for celebration and to be with each other. It was the first of three nights. Um, which is a large amount of celebration for those students. And we certainly recognize the time and the um, effort they've put into their years here. But I think it comes back to the community needing to own some of these problems. Um, and other board members can speak. But I do feel that canceling the senior trip as a school function is an appropriate response from this board, if that's what we choose. Other board members? Anne? Well, I certainly agree with what you, um, with what you said. And <laughs> if anything, this board has been, um, it had suffered by the uh, newspaper as much as anybody, you know, in the past month and um, in past years. And it does seem like Cape Elizabeth is, is uh, singled out. And we get, we get a lot of bad press for things we know are going on other places. I wasn't very impressed with, with what looked to me like um, just total denial on the part of other towns about what, what goes on um, at their proms. But I don't think we should hide behind the fact that we get unfair press um, as a reason not to look, look at our own problem. And we do, we do have a problem here. And I think it is just inappropriate for the school board to um, have the faculty of the high school have to take on this trip given what just happened with, uh, with the prom and with uh, the prevailing attitude um, out in the community. And again, it is hard when, when kids who haven't done anything um, are made to suffer the consequences too. But let's just be clear here. We're not talking about the, the trip can't happen. It's just that the school will not have any chaperones. It seems to me this is a perfect time for parents to, to stand up and say, I'm going to support my kids and, and make this a positive event for the kids who um, want to attend it. And we've got to address the kids coming up. We've, and you've got to start somewhere. And we always make an excuse why we can't hold the line on this one. This case is too special and then, you know, there are too many consequences. We've got to have 
consequences and take a stand. And yes, it's uncomfortable. Maybe, but maybe we'll learn from it and, and try to prevent it from happening in the future. And it would be good if we could put some energy into that into, instead of into excusing it. Um, and people who are upset about the consequences of this, I hope, will work with us to prevent this from happening again. That's where the emphasis should be. Priscilla was, was really right. We're spending a lot of time you know, worrying about these three hours when we've got a lot bigger issues here. Are there any other comments? Um, I don't know. We don't need a motion to a, a school trip would be canceled. For well, I think what you have given us is your consensus. Yes, everybody has spoken. Thank you. Next item on the agenda: um, Superintendent's report. I have a communication. Oh. Um, just to inform the school community and, and the public at large that um, on May 30th, 1996, will be the uh, graduation and recognition day for Portland Arts and Technology High School. Um, session one ceremony will begin at 8.30 a.m. and session two will begin at 11.30 a.m. We do have students who go to both sessions. So just to make aware that that is their graduation recognition day. Can you give those dates again? Sure. It's on the 30th of May. And the first session is at 8.30 a.m. And the second session students are at 11.30 a.m. Um, and I have a request. Are, are you attending that? I probably will. This is PATHS. Yes. If um, certain students or any of our students receive any um, commemorative awards or whatever, will you make sure the office knows immediately about that? For right. And Sharon Merrill has also been the other um, staff person who has been on the advisory committee this year, too. So she has been regularly attending those meetings. Okay, good. Thank you. Are there any other communications? Next item on the agenda, superintendent's report. And we have a presentation tonight. You can see the screens that are up. Jim Curry, Professor Jim Curry from USM. He gave you a uh, presentation last year. Um, as I recall, it was also a presentation following a student discussion. Um, so I told him that somehow we seem to plan these things, Jim. <laughs> um, at any rate, uh, he is here to follow up uh, when what he presented last year was work that had gone on with a course he taught for teachers at Pond Cove. This will be some work from the middle school, and he will also be uh, using this opportunity to share with you some of the work that has already started uh, for the course that is ongoing and will be ongoing until next December uh, associated with the research strand, which is building on the work that was going on last year and that Jim is um, supporting for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just uh, so that I just stay within the parameters, how much time should I strike through my comments? I, I have the same problem I did last year. I got, I got very excited about the things at the middle school. And I thought I'd come up with 20 transparencies, and I'd uh, come up with considerably more. Uh, but I will keep within any time limit you specify. Well, and give us a guess. Um, well, uh, 15 minutes is probably too little. But if you use that as a kind of chunk to think about, I will do that. sure, you'll be questions and comments. So uh, many of actually, the other things I have in my agenda are largely covered by reports in the packet. I think we, we certainly won't be spending any time trying to go over all that stuff. I'll just make some quick comments about them. And uh, so go right ahead. OK. Well, it is always a pleasure to be able to present a course in Cape Elizabeth. And I had a very good time getting to know your teachers and many of your students. And also, having an opportunity to uh, to brag about your school district when I go to uh, other parts of the state. I, I heard some uh, justifiable uh, concern about the uh, uh, all the negative comments being made about Cape Elizabeth, but I had an opportunity to say a lot of good things about your, uh, about your school district, and it's been a pleasure to do so. Um, these are the names of the middle school teachers who participated in a course uh, during the spring semester of 1995. I'll put that same list over here. I know that that's difficult for people here to see, but just for me to uh, refer to and point out some highlights. Um, 
And we did use the same model that we used at Con Co, that the teachers used so well at Con Co. We looked at four different dimensions of learning that we thought would be important in terms of being able to accommodate a very wide range of students. And let me emphasize, our goal was to make sure that all students had opportunity to move from potential to performance through the learning experience. Another one of our goals was to make sure that there was a common language of learning so that a kindergarten teacher could communicate clearly with a fourth grade teacher, that a general education teacher could communicate well with a special education teacher, that a specialist, go ahead. Whatever is your pleasure. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. And it's been very gratifying in return trips to the, uh, the elementary school and in ongoing trips to the middle school that I hear teachers using this common language of learning as they discuss different challenges, as they plan learning experiences. One of the areas in which we focused was, once again, in the area of product and assessment, looking at real-world products and an authentic assessment so that students who were, in fact, developing their ideas would have genuinely good ways to present them. And we developed uh, two new publications. Uh, once again, we developed one publication entitled Product Descriptors, and that was a collection of about, Mary, what would you say, about 100 or so uh, clear standards for products that would be written, visual, oral, and kinesthetic. And from the logs that I read from the middle school teachers and from my observations afterward, it seemed to me that they were very influential on in helping students to understand the clear standards for excellence that had been set for them. Uh, Nancy, maybe you have a comment about that too, the use of product descriptors in the, in the school. I've been very impressed. I would just say, and I don't want to take a lot of your time, Jim, but they have been used widely. In fact, if you drop into Mary Ann Casey's room, her students can tell you how to develop a product descriptor, and they find it very helpful when they do any project to have one. Also, recently I was talking with Hayden Atwood, another one of our participants, and he's written a product descriptor for faculty about how to remember how to use the library as a resource for all of the projects that they might be assigning. So it really has become part of our common language and school culture. And one of the things that I like so much uh, that's going on at both the elementary school and the middle school is when teachers now post excellent work on the board, they put the standards for that excellent work right next to the student's work. So part of the language that I hear when I go into the schools is the students reflecting on what is excellent work. I happened to be at the, uh, at the uh, kindergarten building uh, one day, and a number of the students who know who I am, uh, students in Ted DeMille's class, just came up and said to me, oh, Mr. Curry, come and look at my work. It's detailed. It's very detailed. I have, I have fingers on the hands. I have holes in the ears. And the kids really talk about what is detailed work, what is colorful work, what is careful work. For those of you who have not seen a product descriptor previously, it's a very simple form. Uh, it simply asks that we take whatever the form of the product is and write it in this slot, and that could be timeline, that could be oral presentation, that could be a diorama, that could be any product form. And then we write the modality in this slot. And generally, we focused around these four modalities, products that allow students to demonstrate what they've learned by moving, by speaking, by depicting, and by writing. And we seem to have a pretty even balance among those. Um, so product has been a large part. But we came out with a second document that is in its final editing, and that is good comprehensive units to support excellence of instruction. And the middle school teachers did a, just a fabulous job on those. Let me share with you a couple of vignettes of uh, people I enjoy. And I'm sure you recognize some of these individuals. Uh, this is Jamie Michaud. And uh, she is a language arts teacher. And she wanted students to do a very good job in their oral presentations. She also wanted them to balance their basic thinking skills with their abstract thinking skills. You will find that all of the teachers who have participated can speak meaningfully to children about what kind of thinking they need to do in order to be successful. And that's important because in the MEAs, in almost every MEA item, the students need to identify what kind of thinking they are being asked to do in order to be successful. It's a very interesting example. Um, on one MEA item for fourth grade, it says, develop an advertisement or advertisement in order to convince someone to grow and consume sunflower seeds, use the information in the article to make your argument. Please notice the parts. Where did students learn how to do a good advertisement? 
how would they know that the verb convince is a critical thinking skill? No teacher could possibly prepare students to know that sunflower seed was going to be on the state uh, exam, but they need to know that is the focus of content, and they know, need to know how to collect information from the article in order to be successful. So what we see is that the kids are becoming more adept in understanding what kind of thinking is being asked of them. One of the product descriptors that Jamie developed was this one on an oral report. I thought it was very clear. And when I had opportunity to go into the classroom and listen to the students present, they seemed to be very clear on the standards as well. Jamie also posts excellent work in her classroom, and I like the title, Great Work. I think that has a nice sound to it. She always has the product descriptor up, the title, and then the different types of work that have been done. Another type of product that she has asked for are good critical thinking book reviews of students. And she always has the students write up a good presentation on why they selected the book and why it was useful. What I like is there is a cover page up on the board and all of those are collected and put in a notebook so that students in looking for other books they might be interested in reading can look and see what other students have said. Just very well done. Um, as I looked through the work and as I talked to Jamie about how she had been using product descriptors, what she told me was that the kids were becoming more and more proficient at taking responsibility for not only assessing their own work, but talking about quality expectations. And just something to think about that I think is, is very useful. I better skip right ahead here. Um, another teacher whom I enjoy uh, very much is uh, Bev Bisbee, and I promise the board members that's the old school, not the new school. Teachers are not putting all of that tape up on the wall. <laughs> and one of the product descriptors, because I know that's against the rules, um, one of the product descriptors that she came up with was this uh, poster ad for Bookshare. And this is as it appeared on the wall outside of her room. She invited kids to make a really strong point for why other individuals should be excited about a book that they read. That's a lot different than writing a book report. I want kids to be good writers, but I also want them to be good critical thinkers and convincers in quality ways, too. So this is the old hallway with lots and lots of Bookshare posters up with clear arguments on why they are good books. So for example, here is one presentation by a student on To Kill a Mockingbird. It might interest you to know that the local bookstore owner in South Portland I heard about these posters and was so impressed by the good thinking and the quality work that the students did that he asked if he could borrow those and put those in the window of his bookstore. And I did go and visit the bookstore and those, and those posters done by eighth graders were posted in the front of the store on why people should become excited about certain types of books and certain authors. And I have going to do mega skipping here and moving right along. Uh, let me just show you a math teacher whom I enjoy. This is a Joe Dones, and um, he did such a great job on teaching the kids intuitively axioms of geometry that I just wished that he had been my geometry teacher when I went through geometry. Now, I don't know how many of you on the board uh, had to memorize geometry axioms. Uh, I memorized about a gajillion. I'm pretty sure that's what it was, give or take. And I had a, a large stack. I remember four by six cards and my geometry teacher at the time insisted that we memorize these very clearly. What Joe did that I thought was absolutely terrific was that he gave the kids a very hands-on activity on taking an X and Y axes, taking one slightly askance and then making connections on interval numbers. Then he walked around and he asked kids what they were noticing about angulation in geometric shapes. And the kids were able to articulate for him their ahas that were the same axioms that I learned through memorization. I find a number of your teachers at the middle school are very good at teaching lessons intuitively and inductively rather than simply always telling students. And then they use product descriptors to help kids understand why their work was quality work. Actually, Joe was even sneakier on this. What he did is he said, now that you've developed these geometric presentations and I have to grade them, I don't know how I'm going to do that. What would be really good standards for being able to present information geometrically? And the kid said, oh, we can help you, Mr. Dones. We can talk about what would be quality in terms of a presentation 
on geometric shapes. So that was quite a bit of fun to see also. Um, I hate to skip some of these, but this is, this is um, Deb. And um, Deborah is a social studies teacher, Deb Cross, and she has a wonderful poster up in her room that helps kids to understand that not everything in the book, some of the questions in the book ask them to think cri critically and some answers in the book, some questions in the book, ask the students simply to be good consumers of information. She said that was a very difficult concept initially. But I like this map. It says the world of thinking. And then she has that taxonomy of thinking up on the board to know, to understand, to be able to use, to be able to generate ideas, and to be able to think critically. And what uh, Deb Cross showed me was the kids now can go through, read the questions at the end of the chapter, and say, oh, that's not something I can just look up. I have to think about that. Isn't that right? Well, that's wonderful for middle school kids to say and reflect on the fact they have to think about the information, not simply look the information up. Um, she and the social studies team came up with a dynamite set of product descriptors that they, in turn, then shared with their interdisciplinary team members. And that's the important point I'd like to make. While many times the teachers worked with content colleagues, they then went back to their colleagues on the interdisciplinary team and said, gee, we developed a MAPS product descriptor that we think will really help us. But you know, I'll bet that you could use MAP in literature to talk about story maps. Or I'll bet you could use MAP in social study and science to talk about plate tectonics. Or I'll bet you could talk about maps to look at longitude and latitude and mathematics. So the middle school teachers have done an excellent job of sharing with colleagues their expertise. And I think that's been highly useful also. I'm going to skip right along here. <laughs> One of the other teachers I enjoy, I always enjoy going to her class, is Gail Parker. And Gail Parker is a real advocate of kids learning how to learn. She really chats with them about what are quality ways to learn. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you know this, but uh, Gail recently came out with a publication, and it's entitled Creative Activities for Music and Humanities Classes. So you have actually two or three authors on your middle school uh, faculty. I'll just mention that Steve Connolly also recently co-authored a publication entitled Journey for the Planet. And it's an excellent publication on making students aware of critical issues in terms of the environment. So I just want to mention that because they're, they're very well done. Uh, Gail did a dynamite product descriptor with her colleagues on what makes a really good social studies unit. So the kids at the end of a unit are able to go through and to make sure that they've completed all of the parts of the assignment and that they've done those very, very well. The time that I visited Gail's class, she came up with a great idea to have kids think critically and also use information. She asked them to imagine in their teams that they had been asked to develop 12 posters that could be used by middle school teachers to teach the American Revolution. And she said, but it's only 12. And there are many key events that went on during the American Revolution. So what you need to do is to work in your teams. And this is the who is responsible for what packet. I like that notion. And the kids then had to look through the information on the American Revolution and decide what would be the 12 most telling and important events that if an individual understood those 12, they would be knowledgeable about the essence of the American Revolution. That's a wonderful example of critical thinking, decision making, production, cooperative learning, and the like. And as I listened in on these fifth graders, I was truly impressed by their ability to weigh out, well, why not this event instead of this event? Why not this action instead of that action? And the students, by the time they finished, had come up with excellent presentations on what would be the 12 posters that best represented uh, the causes, the effects, uh, the events of the American Revolution. See how fast I can turn transparencies over here. Um, in terms of what I've shown so far, do you have any questions that you'd like to ask? I'm really proud of your teachers. They do a good job. I love the pictures. Yeah. I'm sorry? I love the pictures. I love, I love the way the kids Aren't they? You capture their concentration. Oh, the kids do a great job. They just do a great job. There's a picture of Steve, by the way in his publication. Here's a group, this group, they, boy, they had some serious conversations about what's what and who's who, and they, they were really right down to the point. It was great. Um, oh, gee, I hate to skip this one, but I'll just show you briefly. This is Steve Price, 
and he did a dynamite presentation uh, with the kids on the, the whole um, history of space exploration and what it means to be an explorer and how to take risks and, and what are reasonable risks and what are not reasonable risks. And he gave the kids these great little vignettes on, on what has happened in terms of space and he really challenged them to go about the process of doing some serious research and asking questions. And one of the students who happened to be studying about, uh, about the tragedy of uh, Dick Scobie in Apollo 13. And um, I mentioned in the course of the class that uh, Dick Scobie's wife, June Scobie, was a friend of mine. And, and she and I had served on a number of national boards together. And, and the girl who was doing the study walked up to me and said, well, I need to interview you. There's some information you might have. And I said, gee, I have to run on to the next class. She said, don't worry, I'll fax the information to you. And what's your fax number at home? So I gave it to her and she wrote up her questionnaire and she said, later we could use email if we needed to. And I said, okay, well that's fine. So she faxed off this questionnaire to me. So I'm filling it out very frantically and sending it back to this child who's doing her research. And Steve just had a very wonderful way of asking. You know, it's very interesting. The kids frequently came up and they wanted to simply know. They simply wanted to be told but Steve found a really nice way to entice kids into asking good questions and really leading them in terms of the discussion. And I'm skipping and skipping, and I want to get to this next point. The next point I want to make is that as a result of the really good activities going on uh, at the different schools, uh, a number of the teachers opted to enter into an independent study project that's going on in your schools right now, part of information literacy and they're doing a great job. Um, each team, Pond Cove, the middle school, and the high school, came up with a good form. This is the one from the middle school, and this is the one from the elementary school, and this is the form from the high school, and we are basically beca have become explorers of excellent practices within Cape Elizabeth schools. And we are using these as cover pages to find good practices, to organize them, and to store them both electronically and in paper form so that any teacher in any classroom in Cape Elizabeth will be able to say, I want to show kids how to select a topic. I'm going to go down to the library and I'm going to take out a computer disk. I'm going to find what would be an appropriate grade level challenge and content. And I'm going to show my kids, Cape Elizabeth kids, picking topics and being successful and doing a really good job. I'm excited about this project. I'll just mention one other teacher whom I've enjoyed a lot, and um, this is uh, Mary Ann Casey, and uh, she, she does such a good job with her kids. Here's an example of a research report on whales, and when I visited the classroom, boy, she had a very well-organized packet, just so well-organized, and the kids were able to follow it, and they had to use all of the resources in the library, and they did a, a dynamite job. Now, Madam Chair, I did not realize this was uh, your daughter when I went and questioned, but I asked who was moving right ahead and doing a good job. I believe you know this young lady. And she was doing her report on the killer whale, and she was very well organized. And another student who was doing an excellent job was Joy Higgins, and she was also, she was doing her report on the beluga whale. In both cases, Marianne set very clear standards on what kids needed to do. And Madam Chair, you probably recognize this. This is her file folder that she had to keep with all of her research information on for info track, for CD-ROM, for using the newspaper. Actually, these two students took me on a good tour and they advised me on how we might collect research. And it occurred to me that when I was their age, high tech was like an abacus, I'm pretty sure. And here they're using info track. They're collecting information. Hayden Atwood is just, he's a wonderful person. He has given the teachers really good, clear guidelines on how to help the kids use the library effectively. Um, my 15 minutes is up, and uh, there's no shortage of transparencies, but I just say, I'd summarize by saying, in your schools, it seems that we have a common language of learning. We're able to use that language to identify what we do well, clarify our expectations for children, and engage them in good exploration of facts rather than simply being consumers of information. And I'm delighted that the elementary, the middle school, and the high school are all engaged in this endeavor. So thank you for your time, and if there are no questions,
I just want to say thank you, and I can say as a parent of a child who's involved with this, the product descriptors are wonderful to have, and they really, really look for them now for anything. Any reports they do, they know what's expected, and they know how to meet it to then move on to the next step, and it's, it, they're really wonderful. You can really see the um, work you have done. In it's the been system. wonderful. It's yeah. just been great to see, see that, how successful the teachers and the kids have been. Yeah. So, and by the way, in every class, Mary Bruns has been the person who's helped me out. And I just want the board to know she is invaluable. I mean, she has helped <laughs> me so much, and I, I do thank her so much also. Well, let me turn it back over to you, and thanks again. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? No. Thank you. I'm just going to point out um, what we did this year in starting a discussion uh, group with teachers from every uh, building on the research tree and it was a deliberate attempt to build on that kind of work. It's so obvious that it has many uh, tie-ins and so the course that's now going on is tied directly to some of the issues that were brought up in that research strand and um, it's exciting. It is, uh, what I feel is particularly sound is that we're building on principles that have already um, been shared, not only of course with the staff but with, with students. Uh, that's a cumulative process, and it's a very sound way to give people um, a way, students, hopefully their parents, and, uh, and the teachers a way to think about curriculum. Because as we work on systemic curriculum, uh, a big block is that people tend to think of curriculum in either little bitsy pieces, they think of it as units in a textbook, or they even think of it as entirely separate disciplines. And Bridging those, um, those, uh, that feeling of separateness is what the informa information age, I think, is requiring of all of us. And I'm very happy that you're with us, Jim. Thank you. And actually, that segues nicely, and, and, and I'm certainly not going to go over all this stuff, but what I did was to include in your packet, um, there's a, another committee that is uh, similar to this but has a different focus called the Reading Committee, uh, which is tied to, to some policy. I actually summarized some of the recommendations for policy uh, as that gets developed. Uh, I also have a handout that I referenced in my comments, and I know I have it here somewhere. Oh, here it is. Uh, Kelly Hassan, who's been on sabbatical at Harvard's Graduate School of Education has been bringing us some wonderful stuff on um, various aspects of reading study skills, all of which frankly mesh with the foundation work that, that Jim has been demonstrating. And I just thought you might be interested in this. I happen to think it's an excellent summary, uh, particularly not only the stages of reading, but for those of you who want to really look at this, what the good reader does and what the poor reader may do. Um, that those are actually, as an adult, you might be interested in looking at those and examining your own reading patterns and habits because um, many people who as adults feel that they are somewhat handicapped uh, in the speed or accuracy with which they're reading, you might actually find something there that would uh, be of personal interest. And the third page, examples of support strategies. All of the material I included in your packet from the three buildings, it talks about reading strategies. It seemed to me it was important for you to have as much information as you care to have to understand what the reference of the word strategy is. Terribly important, also tied to that whole notion of giving kids a way of thinking about their own thinking, which is also what the product descriptors are all about. They also in this, uh, you know, I gave you material on the summaries of some of the discussions that went on in our staff development day that was focused on systemic curriculum. I won't go into that unless you have some specific questions. And the last thing in that section was a summary of a state requirement that uh, we, we looked at in the fall and now it's time to look at it again to basically uh, drawing on all of the work that's gone on in these various groups for curriculum as well as the mission vision statement uh, discussions uh, and a couple of others that I've, oh, the National Science Grant. Um, and frankly, any of the board, if you have time on the 29th and want to join that meeting, we'd be delighted to have you. I think it's a good opportunity. We'll, our goal will be to, as simply as possible, draw up a chart that has specific, some fairly fundamental specific goals. Uh, I think you'll find it useful as you build your goals for next year. 
So there's a lot of stuff. Any questions or comments, we'd be happy to hear. Ann? Um, Connie, can I just clarify as far as the reading committee goes? I was unclear from your memo whether this is the this is kind of the recommendation from the committee to the board to start developing a policy or at this point with all the other work going on, you know, still at the at the committee level? Well, that committee has really blossomed. It's become more than I think what you had originally envisioned when you started talking about a reading policy because they, they're doing a lot of work on assessment, um, which is really a key issue. They've also looked at the, uh, to the degree that the information is available on the state learning results. Uh, been lots of healthy arguments between different grades uh, or different building levels as to exactly how our local assessments and performance standards should be written. Um, so that work will be ongoing. On the other hand, it was our understanding that you were looking for some specific uh, guidelines for developing a policy, and the one, the, the four that I have set down here are the ones that this group uh, agrees to at this point, and I personally think they are fundamental. Um, and I think the way that your board policy will be developed will be to have a key set of statements like this. Um, and again, you're certainly not going to put in your policy the entire sweep of of uh, performance standards and assessments for the entire system, but you will want to reference them in some summary way. And at this point, I think the committee really would be curious to know how much data do you want. We've given you quite a lot to look at. Is that what you had in mind? Do you want more specific, less specific, or what? Well, that's, that's why I was asking you really where it stands. Maybe we should just take it to the policy committee and talk about you know, is, is this enough to, to write a policy? Because we have been talking all along about the board policy being a pretty short exactly. and <laughs> I think, point. Uh, right, and it seems to me those four points are key that, um, that state a fundamental commitment to a top quality reading program, K-12. It should contain a clear, unequivocal definition of the reading process and provide a framework for expectations. It should make clear that reading comprehension is a concern of all teachers, not just those officially designated language arts teachers. Uh, it should contain a commitment to support for the staff development materials and other resources needed to achieve a quality reading program. I think those are the key components. They, they are key. I would just wonder if there was any discussion about making a statement of, of specifically about student achievement. Well, that is the standards and performance standards, content standards, and expectations of already you have, you have some preliminary outlines of those kinds of things. Um, and I would see that as work that's going to have to continue next year. Now, I think it would be good to have that discussion at the board level so those of us who are involved in this work can kind of understand exactly where you're, you know, what you mean by that, what you have in mind for some kind of package that fits the board policy use and how much you want referenced uh, or interested in referencing. Uh, but that's ongoing work. Yeah, I just, I, I do think we need a few fundamental statements, but I also think it would be um, very good um, in terms of focusing people on what we really mean when we say these things, if we could make some kind of um, statement about a benchmark when you leave Pond Cove, when you meet the right. middle school, when you leave the high school. Right. You know, just a one sentence profile of what a reader looks like. Um, I don't I'm think not you sure that one sentence, but they No, 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 but, but, but it, actually that's my exact point, is that we can go on and on and on forever, but I think we ought to try, you know, try to go through the exercise of trying to crystallize it, um, right. because we do tend to perseverate. And ju just in terms of having the public understand, um, you know, all this great work and, um, you know, backup material um, that comes out, I think it, w it would be helpful just to at least have, have the discussion. Yes. Do you think it would be possible to have some members of this committee come to a policy meeting where we specifically look at drafting um, Sure. Policy? I mean, I, th I think people Rather have been expecting to do that, don't you, Nancy? I think so. Yeah. We can talk about mm -hmm. proper timing, but that would make thank sense. you. Thank you very much um, for all the work. That I know it's been um, a lot of work. It sounds like it's been a lot of fun too, though. Actually, it is. <laughs> uh, the next item on the agenda is school board subcommittees and reports. Finance subcommittee first, Charlie. Um, can I just interject? There are a couple of seniors that arrived. I don't know. If 
they want to speak to an issue we've already addressed. Yeah, that's at the board. Do you know if they want to address? That's at the board's will. I mean, we've already addressed the issue. But. It's only one senior. Um, board's will. Fine. Okay. My name's Kelly Allen, and I'm on the softball team, and I'm a senior. And um, I have something to say about the senior class trip that you guys just canceled, like, sponsored by the school. Um, I'm one of the people who got in trouble, and I got in a lot of trouble. And whoever said, I don't know, I was watching it on TV that people don't feel bad, but the whole, whole senior class does feel bad about it. And I think by telling us that we can't have our senior trip is... Um, when we want to like have this, and I've talked to a lot of people in my grade, and they want to all go, and no one's planning on doing anything before, and redeeming themselves, and by saying that it's not a school-sponsored trip, it's saying we can't have it with our teachers and with the administrators, and that's pretty much the whole point of it. I mean, that's, I think that's half the fun of it, to be with the teachers and everybody else and enjoy the time with them. And I don't know if many parents, I mean, maybe there will be a committee who will get it together and everything, but I just don't think that, uh, by taking that away from us and it's not fair to the kids who didn't do anything wrong because you're taking something away from them when they didn't do anything wrong at the prom and there was a big majority of people who did something wrong at the prom and it's very wrong and people feel bad about it and some people have come forward and some people haven't but you can't do anything about that and just this year now you're you're saying that um we can't have our trip and it's gone on in the past and maybe it hasn't been as big of a problem but it has been a problem and so now we're losing our senior class trip. And because, I mean, because of a few people who turned themselves in or the majority of people who didn't or whatever, but it's not fair to the people who didn't do anything wrong. And uh, I don't think that um, by taking it away is going to do any good. I think it's going to make the students, it's just going to make them go more against the faculty when we're trying to work with them. I've had a lot of talks with Mr. Fusco and Mr. Ray. and. Uh, we tried very hard to have you guys understand us on this and not take it away from us because I personally would feel very bad if, um, well, you guys already did take it away, but I feel very bad because, I mean, I'm one of the people who did get in trouble and it's almost like it's not put on us, but I feel like, you know, I had a major part in that and that's not fair to the rest of my classmates. And uh, maybe the people who did turn themselves in shouldn't be allowed to go or something like that, but I don't think taking it away from everybody is a fair thing to do. We've worked really hard the past four years, and this was a, I mean, the prom was a big, big downfall and a bad thing, but I don't think taking away the senior trip is gonna help anything at all, not anything at all. I don't think that's fair to the, especially the people who didn't do anything wrong. Like my brother, I was just talking to him at home, watching on television and almost got like angry at the fact, you know, obviously everyone's gonna be angry and it's not fair to him. He didn't do a thing wrong and he can't go on the senior class trip when he was looking forward to it and everyone else was looking forward to it. I just don't think it's very fair that you guys just automatically, you know, and like seniors, yeah, we, we did a lot of drinking before and after or whatever, but so did other grades, and I'm not trying to say anything about that, but you're taking away the senior trip from us, but why just us, you know? Is it, was it just us? I don't think it was at all. I don't think that's fair at all. And uh, I just don't think that that's going to help anything at all by taking it away from us because it's going to make all the students look, go against the faculty more when we're trying to work with them on this. And basically what I think is you guys are supposed to like work with us and help us out rather than punish us. And it just feels like this punishment being put on us. And um, I don't know, I just, I don't think by punishing us is going to do any good. I really don't. And that's just all I have to say. And. Uh, I don't know, that's it, but if anybody has any questions. <laughs> Thank you, I, I understand your emotion, um, and, and we are very aware of the dilemma. Thank you for speaking out. Uh, next item on the agenda is the Finance Subcommittee. Okay, the Finance Subcommittee met at 6.30 in the Town Chambers Conference Room. Um, we signed the warrants. Um, we 
uh, went over requests by community services to again enter into a van lease purchase um, we essentially approved that um, we talked about the investment earnings um, from the bond issue and where it might be applied as, as either to be bleacher repairs or purchase reviewed the school lunch program and reviewed several items under the appropriations reports that seem to be over substantially um, at this time of the year. Thank you, Charlie. Um, next report is Superintendent Search Committee. Anne? The Superintendent Search is ongoing at this time. <laughs> Hopefully we'll have um, something more substantive to say at our June meeting. Thank you, Anne. Uh, the next report is the Technology Committee. I don't know, Charlie or Keith? Um, technology com Committee met on April 29th in the high school Macintosh lab. Um, at that time, the Apples for Education final tallies and results were presented. And um, I want to thank the community for their support in providing their Shaw's receipts. Um, there was a total of $654,686 worth of receipts turned in. And with that, we were able to um, provide for each school, and it was pretty much equal, the participation from each school. Um, some of the things that we were able to, with the points, and the points were based on, on thousands of dollars. <laughs> such as uh, for every $10,000, you got a point. So the closer you don't get a lot out of 654,000, but we did get some things, um, such as <clears throat> Pond Cove got a color style writer, um, a Super Express modem, a Grolier's encyclopedia, um, a CD, a print shop deluxe ensemble, a World of Animals CD, a World of Plants CD, Exploring the Solar System CD and a Mammals Encyclopedia CD and a Clip Arts for Science Teachers. In the middle school, they got a color scanner, an Oregon Trail CD, a 3D Atlas, Storybook Weaver Deluxe, a Timeliner from Macintosh, uh, a T-Liner AF AM History, a T-Liner American History, and a T-Liner Great Ocean and a print shop deluxe ensemble. And the high school chose to put their points towards two items, a color scanner and a color style writer 2400. Again, I thank the community and the community and volunteers who had to go through and highlight um, and take out anything that had to do with coupons. I mean, it was, they had to look at every single, it was quite involved. So I thank those volunteers who took on that project. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, we also, oh. I'm not <laughs> <laughs> uh, We reviewed the technology in service. Um, we also reviewed the budget. At that point, we were assured that it was going to go through, and it did last night. Um, we talked about the community wide network design proposal, and um, there is a, um, a memo in your a letter of assurance about applying for a community technology grant, and that's a planning grant of $2,500. Um, and we also talked about the 9X PUC connections, and it was the consensus that we would, cons we would proceed on with the 56K at this time, not knowing what other options down the road would be coming. Um, and um, we also reviewed the system-wide technology resource, person job description, and if you noticed in Sunday's paper, there was an advertisement for that position. Great, thank you, yes, Charlie. Anne. Can I, can I oh, ask one question? Um, who, is there an actual search committee that, that's going to be reviewing those applications, or who, who's doing that? Well, basically, uh, from the technology committee discussion, um, 
we are working with Jay Shermer also from the town library. So he, I, and I believe, Charlie, weren't you the one who also agreed? Um, we may add somebody else to that, but that will be the nucleus. Okay. I think the, the majority of the discussion wasn't not on the need for the person, but what type of contract they would come under, whether they would come under a teaching contract or whether they would come under an administrative contract. Or a letter of, I, I have done a little research on that, and most of the districts in the area are, uh, the people they have hired are people basically who are teachers, certified teachers, and are being hired under teaching contracts. An interesting issue, I had a quick conversation with Jeannie Gulliver, who is really the point person on the statewide technology, because um, it's another example of a calendar need, or I guess I should put it a, a need that is certainly going to exceed the normal teacher contract. Uh, so that's going to be something we're going to wrestle with. We probably will be able to make this higher uh, without too much difficulty, because I think that's a baseline that people are using. But districts like Scarborough, for instance, which have a, a strong and fairly well developed now town and school network, uh, they have four people who are full-time, uh, some technicians, some actually running, you know, serving the network, others who are hands-on with, with teachers, but that's a, that was the agreed-upon thrust of this particular position, so it will most likely be a teaching contract. Thank you. Anything else, Charlie? No, I'm finished. Thanks. Um, building committee, Sue, are you going to do that? Or Connie? Well, um, in a nutshell, uh, I'll say a couple things and then anything I forget you adding. Uh, we are at the point now where we have a uh, subcommittee, really, or a residue of the building committee uh, dealing with the, that inevitable push when you, everybody's losing patience and we want to get things done. Uh, we are, however, uh, pleased to report that <clears throat> the sub the subs, that is, the subcontractors of the GC are in, really working now on the punch list. It, we also, of course, had some outside work that had to wait until spring, so that's moving along. People can see that. Um, and uh, again, Sue is maintaining her status as needed for this communication. We realize with outside work, we once again have to be sure that we are communicating when that work can be done and so forth, so that process is, is ongoing. Uh, and we are satisfied that our um, residue building committee is giving us expert assistance in dealing with whatever technical issues are cropping up. you want to add anything to that? Okay. Thank you. Uh, Arts committee. Um, yeah, we met on um, April 22nd. Um, you all basically got the minutes in your packet. We um, discussed the few site visits that have occurred so far. The intention is to concentrate more on those in the fall. Um, this year we decided to spend more effort into getting the kind of the mission statement and the guiding principles down. Um, you also had in your packet a draft of um, those principles. Um, the language on them is still a little bit awkward. You might have had that impression as you read through some of them. There's a subgroup of the Arts Committee that's working on that, and those should be cleaned up for our next meeting. Um, I think that the basic ideas are pretty much what they're going to be. It's just a, reworking the language a little bit. And as always with something like this, you get a piece of paper with words on it, and it's amazing what goes into getting some words on paper, especially when you have a diverse group of people. Um, at the last meeting, we also discussed the um, March 30th workshop and the presentation that some arts teachers did there. And the next meeting is Wednesday, May 29 at 3.30. Um, Nancy, the minutes here said the Pond Cove Art Room, and my handwritten note said Middle School Art Room. So do you remember which we? Um, so, this is not going to be that. so it will be at the Pond Cove Art Room. OK, Pond Cove Art Room on May 29. Thank you, Carla. Mm -hmm. um, athletic Study Committee. All you have is a notice, the list happening. of participants, and that it is happening, right? Right. That's all we need to say. Thanks. And next item on the agenda is unfinished business, adoption of the 96-97 calendar. Once again, I haven't had any. I will just say I did have a little feedback at Election Day <laughs> from the... Um, from the town side that they are worried about the parking problem for the November election. Um, 
and would love it if we wouldn't have school that day or would have a teacher workshop day. And I assured them we could handle that by really having students and faculty park other places that day and we could get that lot cleaned out for election day and that we could work on that. Um, so that was the only feedback I had. I would point out that in our science grant, we were trying to get the, some days to, um, that would be at least possible for joint work and uh, it turns out that South Portland also has January 2nd and 3rd. Scarborough had some other issues that they were dealing with, but they thought they would have some availability. So, you know, those kinds of conversations are important, too, for shared needs. Could I have a motion? Can I move we accept this calendar as presented? Is there a second? Second. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Seven zero. Easiest calendar I've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> um, next item is co-curricular fee committee report and recommendations. In your packet, you have a summary. You had seen most of this uh, committee's report uh, last month. We didn't take a vote on it. When you take a vote um, tonight, I will. I, I don't think we included that, but it will cover those items that were accepted, discussed. Um, last month, it was single vote for all the recommendations. The issues here, um, probably I should explain that the, we followed up a couple of requests from last time for extra hours. We are satisfied that those are reasonable requests. I did check with our budget to make sure that we did have some funds from a, the um, stipend for the technology committee chair, which is now being folded into the duties of the technology coordinator position, and it made it possible for us to make some of those adjustments as listed here. Um, the major point of our discussion, frankly, was to look at the high school drama hours, currently listed uh, at 600 for director and 150 for theater assistant. We follow an extended discussion because there seemed to be some changes in the um, drama program, notable last year and also this year. Uh, so our recommendations are that there should be a review of what the school board, faculty, and students think the theater program at Cape Elizabeth High School should be. The committee suggests the current system-wide fine arts committee recommend a process for such a review, and it is expected that a report will be ready in time for the FY98 budget. As a transition measure for next year, FY97, the 600 hours plus the 115 hours currently in the budget should be divided into four blocks to be assigned as follows, 250 hours for a fall performance, 250 hours for a spring performance, 100 hours for theater management, and 115 hours for production of a winter performance to be presented in conjunction with a theater class. These changes are being recommended in response to the pattern of performances of the past two years which have not provided as many opportunities for student involvement as had been the case in previous years. It is understood that the positions of directors of the fall and spring direct, uh, that should be um, productions, will be posted in-house and advertised in the paper and the tryouts will be held for parts in the performances. Contracts for these director positions should only be issued after proposals explaining what is a projected performance have been accepted. There are an addition limited funds available in addition to the stipend amounts which can be used in the regular budget process to support these productions. We have questions raised about uh, many times if it's a fairly ambitious production, there is our practice to have extra people come in to help out on a limited basis and our budget uh, does include some funds for that. It might become important to chunk that out in more detail if we get proposals. Um, and the current theater director has been asked to submit a list of those duties that he believes belong to management of the theater. Pending further clarification, the committee asks that the 100 hours reserved for the stipend be held in reserve. The committee further recommends this position also be posted in-house. Any questions, comments? Um, on number one, the committee suggests the current system-wide fine arts committee recommend a process for such a review. Um, is that a recommend, just a recommendation, a charge, a suggestion? <laughs> well, from, you know, the, the task of this co-curricular committee, frankly, is to review year by year the hours assigned to these extracurricular activities and to make any adjustments or recommendations to this body as to what should happen. Um, after much discussion, we really felt that it wasn't clear there had been 
you know, you look back over what has been expected for a drama program, what the 600 hours were assigned to, and uh, there did seem to be a pattern of changes. Therefore, one of the things that we thought was important, and we had uh, Charlie's your representative on that committee also, is that there be a pretty broad-based group that takes a look at what does Cape Elizabeth High School want to have as a theater program for extracurricular. Uh, for instance, we've had a pattern where we've had um, sometimes as many as five productions in a year, that is four one-act one plays done by different classes. Um, we've had you know, musicals, which of course involve lots of kids. Uh, it seems to be time to look over the current pattern and decide what do people want? In the brief discussions we've had so far in curriculum, I mean, we certainly have included drama. And, you know, the committee does realize it's doing a K through 12 curriculum overview also. So I think that would be included. Fine. And we also felt that there are things starting to happen in the middle school with a drama club. So we, we need to really look at it systemically. And maybe some of those hours may have to be allocated somewhere else where there may be more going on. But for the co-curricular fee committee to do that, it, you know, that's beyond our purview to really study other than justification of the needs. Any other questions? I would make only one comment. There was a substantial increase in the natural helpers. Um, they were currently at 110 assigned hours. And as you can see, the, suggest the recommendation is 220 hours. I think that should be explained. Yes, we did have a list actually of 270. Mm -hmm. um, and in double checking that, the, uh, one of the, let me back up, the process for reviewing these hours asks each um, sponsor of a co-curricular uh, event to review on a yearly basis the number of hours, the kinds of the number of productions or, or events or uh, responsibilities because these things do change and the purpose of the co-curricular committee is to either adjust hours up or down depending on what what's going on um, it does seem that that um, there are now two advisors and the um, issue of uh, in the list they had actually exceeded that 220 by 50 uh, they did not expect it all to be um, to be granted and we discussed a way in which we could uh, um, make some adjustment, especially since it has been increasing the advisor, number of advisors and so forth, and that was our suggestion. Um, Andrew Kerr and Katie Lisa are now um, the co-advisors um, and there is a lot more going on than there was under just one advisor. Are there more students? But I don't know the number of students involved, but what they're doing is more in yeah, involved. There are about 40 students involved in that now. And as Connie alluded to, they just answered the question as far as the number of hours that were, were, that were being put in. And it's come up to 270 since that initial 110. And it's expanded with their activities. They go through more training now. The training now is twice a year, I believe, instead of just in the fall. So it's really added up, mm -hmm. and I think it's cumulative over the last couple of years, not necessarily a jump from last mm -hmm. year. And when they finally revisited that and submitted it, uh, the numbers were there. And their intention was not to go to 270, but to just tell it like it is and, mm -hmm. and let, it, uh, let it be. And then Connie and we had talked about at the co-curricular the idea of with two advisors that they each be given, uh, you know, I believe the 100, we mm. talked about the 110 right. hours each, and they, co they, they share the responsibility. So. And what about the, uh, the um, thank you, Rick. Okay. <laughs> Gail Parker. Oh, yes. Is, is the town going to help um, share that cost of that um, ADA coordinator? Not this year. I don't know. They, we, the bottom line on this one is that there is a law on ADA that does require uh, a school town designated ADA coordinator. Um, one, after considerable discussion, the, uh, again, on this issue, uh, Gail had drawn up a list of things that still need to be done. She has agreed to do them. They're protocol issues for the most part. I think some continuation of policy issues. Um, and once those are done, she indicated ways in which the, uh, not only the duties, but she gave uh, really a diminishing 
number of hours would be involved. So it is the certainly my expectation, listening, listening to that discussion, that this will be a stipend that will um, be decreasing. Um, but right now, it is carried by the schools. Any other discussion? Do I have a motion? Charlie? I move acceptance of the co-curricular um, positions and um, hours as presented. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Oh, any more discussion? All those in favor? 7-0. Uh, the next item on the agenda is new business, um, consideration of a sabbatical request. Including your packet, actually, um, fairly detailed explanation of this request. It, uh, what you have in your packet actually is signed by Kathy Earl, but it should be read to apply to Buddy. And Buddy, Kathy is a teacher in the Falmouth system, um, the wife of Buddy Earl, one of our teachers in the Cape Elizabeth system. Uh, as I noted in, in my um, uh, blue notes to you, uh, normally a process for sabbatical does bring this in um, at an earlier time in the year. Um, Due to some misunderstandings, uh, it didn't come into us in a timely fashion. Uh, we've had a lot of discussion back and forth, including discussion with the Teachers Association, because I think it would be important to have a signed letter that goes with this decision, if you should make it, uh, because uh, it is a contract issue. We do have a timeline in our contract, and we do recognize that it should be followed. Having said as much, um, this is an unusual request. It is a family request. Um, the Falma system has granted uh, Kathy Earl's request. Uh, it has been a many years in the planning. Um, I know from certainly my conversation, and Priscilla is your representative uh, on this group, that Buddy's been an outstanding teacher for us for many years. He will certainly take full advantage of opportunities to understand the educational systems. Um, I'm not sure if they have a placement yet. I know they've been trying to get one, in New, particularly in New Zealand, because of, uh, both of them have interest in the literacy programs there as well as their general um, issues. So I think it's a, uh, a very strong request for a sabbatical. I do recommend it. I do recognize the fact that we will have to have a piece of uh, agreement from the Teachers Association, but that's not going to be a barrier in their eyes. Is there any more discussion, Anne? Um, do we have a letter from the association? Well, it's, I hadn't written it yet because I didn't know what you were going to do with this, but I don't think that, I'm absolutely confident that that's not a bar. Okay, because that's real important. To me. I understand that. Um, but, but something else that's important to me, too, uh, is that um, I guess I would like to see Buddy write a proposal to us for us to see. Um, I understand this is kind of a joint thing, but this is totally a Falmouth proposal, and I guess I'd, I'd like to see him um, write out a proposal of, of what it would mean to the Cape Elizabeth school system. Okay, because all, all this documentation is, is what, he, what his wife wrote for Falmouth. This is true, but... And I'd like, but I would, just, I would just like to see him, you know, to talk a little bit about how he would, um, you know, use use the information com coming back here. Okay. Are you suggesting that this would delay this decision? No, I'm just suggesting it would be nice to, to have something okay. about so, you know, the application to our, to our school system from him. <laughs> Carla? I wanted to clarify, he's only asking for the second half of the year? No, the request is for the full year. Uh, we have talked that over. <laughs> he did originally when he realized that he'd missed the timeline. Um, wonder if that was, if the full year wasn't possible, could he do the half year? Uh, however, in discussing this, um, frankly, from the standpoint of an appropriate substitute teacher, it is really better to have a full year rather than try to interrupt a year. And uh, my recommendation to you is to do it for the full year. Charlie? Does our policy uh, require them to put a process paper up? like this? I'm sorry. Does our policy state that they, they have to, I like the way this, you know, describe your project, describe how your project meets the criteria for innovation. I mean, I like the format. Do we have a similar format 
or do we have any kind of format for application for a sabbatical? The ones that I've seen in the past do not have a format, and in our contract there is no specified format. I agree with you. I like that format, and I would suggest that we adopt it or one similar. But we've always had backup True, material. a letter of some sort explaining right. what they right. hope to. Right, Kelly, Kelly Hassens was quite But I, I think we need to put in to have some kind a of process that, yeah. that informs the board a little more of of what they plan to do and what expectations they hope to gain. I think I was very impressed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I, I think yeah. we can look at this and learn from it and maybe change what we're going to do in the future, but I would like to support Buddy Earl's proposal. No, I support his proposal. I just, I just want to make sure that, that I understood do we have the same kind of process and we don't. Uh, in my conversation with him, it is his hope um, they they do not have placements yet, and they're it's an interesting bind is that they have to have have to know that they're going and there's a lot of um, technicalities in New Zealand, but um, he hopes to communicate back to the middle school and and the Pine Cove Elementary um, either through email, whatever, really on, on hopefully a weekly or monthly basis. Um, and one of the things he really wants to look at is um, the reading recovery program because that's where it came from. But also, New Zealand has a 99% literacy um, achievement, is that the right word? Supposedly the best reading program um, in the world. So getting information about that and the other things we talked about was looking at the school calendar because he thinks that they go for longer days and a longer period in the year. Um, and the way um, teachers uh, communicate K through 8, K through 12. Um, so that's his goals. Is there a motion? Ann. I move that we accept the request for leave of absence for Gilbert Earl. All right, second that. 1996-97 school year. Second. <laughs> Do we want to put any um, criteria that we need that letter from the Teachers Association on it? I, I, I think it's been stated, Connie knows. But yeah. I, I really would like to also see his him, letter from, just, right. just him say, you know. We can certainly do doing. that. Mm -hmm. Right. Any other discussion? All those in favor? 7-0. Yep. Um, next item. <laughs> a consideration of a request for leave of absence for the 96-97 school year. And I have recently been contacted by Marty Costello, uh, the uh, high school staff social studies teacher. Um, for some personal reasons, he has made this request, and I do support it. <clears throat> Any questions or discussion? Is there a motion? I move acceptance of a leave of absence for Marty Costello for the 96-97 school year. Is there a second? Second. Any other discussion? Th this is unpaid, right? It's paid. I said unpaid, but I believe. I'm sorry. I missed. All those in favor? 7-0. I'm sorry, who seconded that? I did. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> um, the next item is a consideration of a request for a half-time leave of absence for the 96-97 school year. And this, too, is unpaid. I <laughs> should make that clear. Um, Lisa Martin, who has recently had a baby boy, uh, is out right now on maternity leave uh, and has requested a half-time leave for next year um, for child care purposes. Obviously, the contract does grant her the right to ask that. Uh, what I am, however, pleased, the way this will work out, Lisa, of course, is one of our reading recovery teachers, and the half time uh, that she does work in reading recovery will be the half that she is teaching, so we will not lose her services as a reading recovery teacher. Are there any questions? Ann? How do we plan to cover the other half? Do we have anybody? Yes, as a matter of fact, we have had uh, the other half is a Title I position, and uh, frankly, for the last three years, including right now, we have had it covered by very capable people.
people. I mean, she's out now, as a matter of fact. Mm. Any other questions? Carla? Um, I just want to be reminded, I know that we've had these conversations earlier, reading recovery is always a half-time position? Yes. Is the chapter one also always? That's been limited by funds. Um, oh. And in the, well, we'll see what happens with the federal budget, but the word is that maybe because Maine is a federal state, we're going to lose chapter one, excuse me, is a rural state. We are likely to lose, as a state, some of our Title I funds because they're going to be concentrated supposedly more in the really um, poverty areas of inner city areas of one kind or another. And uh, since it's a diminished pool, we are not going to compete well for Title I funds. We haven't been competing well for them anyway. They are based primarily on um, indices such as how many students do you have who get free and reduced lunch. And uh, so we are likely to see those shrink even more. Any other questions? Is there Ocho? Just a clarification. We as a district will see those funds diminishing. I don't the whole state. state will. Because the, uh, or at least I've been told that. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> who knows? But that's the way the current um, situation has been shaping up. We'll see in the future exactly what happened. Thank you. Because I, there are areas in the state that are at the poverty levels of other Oh, absolutely. City, so the I problem is from a national policy level, they're looking at where are the concentrated areas uh, and they're simply targeting, making a choice that the big city areas need it more than the rural areas. And those of us in rural states uh, would disagree. And I would concur. Is there a motion? I move that we um, accept Lisa Martin's request for a half-time leave of absence for the 1996-97 school year. Is there a second? Second. Did you state unpaid leave of absence? Unpaid leave of absence. Thank you. Any other discussion? All those in favor? 7-0. And thank you. Our final personnel piece is a letter of resignation from Lori Turley, who has been working with us um, the last couple of years as a part-time music and chorus teacher and uh, as she she explains that she's um, they're making a move and it's going to be very difficult for her to continue and so she is, has submitted her letter of resignation questions and I would just like to comment that um, I'm sorry she's leaving because she has done an outstanding job um, with the kids in the two years she's been here and if anybody was at the, the chorus and band concert, it's really amazing um, what she's gotten out of these kids. I'm sorry she's leaving. Mm -hmm. We all are. Is there a motion? I move acceptance of the resignation of Lori Turley. Is there a second? Priscilla? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Seven zero. Uh, the next item on the agenda is a consideration of the superintendent's request to enter executive session for the purpose of discuss discussing negotiations and the superintendent's search. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? 7-0. Thank you.